Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Hey everyone and welcome to our live class. We're so excited to have you here today. We have a great lecture coming up for you. My name is Anthony and I will be your host. I'm joined on the line by Dr. Michael Chapman, the Director of Product Innovation at Genova Diagnostics, who will be conducting most of the presentation today. I'm going to pass it off to him momentarily to kick off today's topic of the GI effects, precise, reliable, and clinically effective. So I know we're going to learn a lot today on this very exciting topic. Now, I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items before we begin. I've muted everyone by default. And secondly, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them into the chat panel. The questions will come to me as the host, and I will be conducting a live question and answer with Dr. Chapman at the end of today's presentation. And lastly, we will be hosting a live demonstration at the end of today's live class with our Head of Practitioner Partnerships, Adrian Martinez. So for those of you who are new to Rupa Health, feel free to stick around if you'd like to learn about how we can optimize your practice. For those of you who already use us, thank you very much. And if you need to get back to your practice or your day, feel free to hop off at that point in time. So I'd now like to hand it off to Dr. Chapman to begin today's presentation. Great, thanks, Anthony. Um, super happy to be here. And as always, uh, we've been very, very thankful with our relationship with Rupa um, and, and feel like we've done a lot of really great work together. And uh, as Anthony was saying, I uh, am here to talk a little bit about the GI effects, which is our stool profile that we offer here at Genova Diagnostics. And, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the GI effects, then you already know that there's just a ton of information to get to on this report. And it seems like whether it's the microbiome or overall GI evaluations, there's always kind of something to learn. Um, so hopefully you will all take something uh, away from this and uh, you'll also get a little bit of insight about our overall approach at Genova and how we're coming at things a little bit differently and how to use that in your clinical practice. So yeah, without further ado, um, a little bit about me just quickly. Uh, I'm a naturopathic physician trained from Bastyr University. I've been with Genova uh, since 2015 and have had just the sheer pleasure and honor to work uh, with respect to product development. I've been had my head in the research um, ever since I've been here and have been trying to apply that research as much as possible to create the, the products that have the most clinical, actionable information. And with that, uh, I think that takes us right to the GI effects, which is our flagship GI evaluation. Um, Real briefly, so we're going to cover the report, the GIFX Comprehensive 2200 is our, our big overall GI product. Um, we're going to become familiar with how to use some of the new scoring systems. Uh, what are the clinical utility of some of these biomarkers that you may or may not be familiar with? We I think I pretty much have the gambit of biomarkers in the GI evaluation industry. And so some of them may be familiar to you. Uh, maybe you'll get a new spin on them. Others might be brand new. So we're going to cover the biomarkers as much as we can, review the different components of the GI effects. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of pages to the GI effects. And like I was saying, it's, there's always something new to learn about GI evaluation. And with respect to testing and how that relates to the GI tract, it's really not just about how many biomarkers are there, how many bacteria you're measuring, but how are you doing it as well? I think it's almost as important. And we'll even get into a little bit of a conversation around who are you comparing it to? Because I always think that at the end of the day, yes, having an appropriate biomarker is helpful, but the reference range that you're looking at is just as helpful too, because you want to know who you're comparing to. Are we comparing to the general American population who has lots of chronic disease, comorbidities, or are we looking at a healthy cohort that's been questionnaire qualified? These things can really change your understanding of what's considered normal and abnormal and really kind of sets the entire tone of what we even consider normal and healthy so you know what you're comparing to. So I, I think those little details can be super important when it relates to testing and uh, things that we take into very strong consideration here at Genova. So another thing that we're really well known for at Genova Diagnostics is how do we take all the data 
that we're testing because our a lot of these profiles, like the GIFX profile, have a lot of different biomarkers on them, a lot of things to wrap your mind around. And how do we boil all that down into a clinical story that you can understand so you can quickly know what's going on with your patient and then derive some sort of action plan to intervene, right? That's what that's why you're ordering the testing. That's what it's all about is I want to help this patient get better, whether that's GI or anything else. Um, so here at Genova, we take the information and synthesize it. We're kind of well known for this interpretation at a glance. And on the front page of the GI effects, you'll see this right here. We've got this results overview graphic at the top. Then we've got these functional imbalance scores, which we'll talk about a little bit in a minute. And then underneath that, we have therapeutic support options. So right on the front page, maybe you haven't seen the patient or the chart in a little while, you're walking down the hallway and you can immediately say, okay, Right, I remember what we were talking about. I remember what we're gonna do. This person needs to work on X, Y, and Z, and here's how we're gonna do it. So to boil that out, to unpack that a little bit, when we approach GI here at Genova, one of the things I was thinking of was this DIG system. You might've heard of it, the digestion, inflammation, gut microbiome system. And you can see that represented by the sphere here. And these are the three major components of the GI tract, the core functions, right? And you can even break down that gut microbiome section into a couple subsections like, is there an infection on board? Is there a dysbiosis, which might be different than an infection, right? And then what is the bacteria in the microbiome doing? What are they producing? Are they producing good things or bad things? And that's what we mean when we're talking about metabolite imbalance. So really we have these five core functions. And from those core functions, what we did was develop a scoring system. We took the biomarkers pertaining to each category and developed an algorithm. And we did this, we call it a two-factor weighted algorithm where depending on how severely abnormal that biomarker is, is gonna contribute to a worsening score, as well as how important is that biomarker to what we're evaluating? So for example, calprotectin is a very important biomarker for inflammation. I would say even more so than things like secretory IgA. So the calprotectin has more weight compared to the IgA. And that's just a little bit of detail around some of the thought that went into the algorithms and how that scoring system was devised. But in general, the higher the score, the greater the dysfunction and the higher the need for support. And as you can see listed there, we're evaluating those five key areas, digestion, inflammation, microbiome support as it relates to dysbiosis, metabolic imbalance, and infection. And then underneath the scores, we have a list of static things that you might consider from an intervention standpoint. Certainly not all that's in your toolkit, um, but some things that you might commonly be grabbing. And so, you know, for instance, in this case, you see a 10 score for inflammation, dysbiosis, and infection. And underneath that, you might think about some of those things that are listed there. And this can also be a helpful way to translate the results of the test to the patient. Uh, maybe even when you're sitting there with the patient, you can circle some of these intervention options that you're going to be thinking about so they understand, oh, here's why I'm taking this, or here's why the elimination diet's on board, or here's why we're doing increased fermented foods or things like that, so that they can have a one-to-one -one connection too with their scores and their interventions that they're doing to improve, right? And that connects and creates a little bit more compliance, I think, at the end of the day. So that front page synthesis really is kind of a high level overview. And then we get into a high level overview of the microbiome because at the end of the day, the microbiome does a lot, right? It's responsible for so much that's going on systemically. We're learning that more and more every day, but we're still kind of in this gray area of like, what do we do? How do we assess what's normal from the microbiome standpoint? And so previously, and we still do have this page of commensal bacteria. This is a PCR analysis. 24 different bacteria, but clinicians really seem to kind of have a hard time understandably saying, what do I do with the 24 commensal bacteria? What do I do with this information? Um, I know it says one thing in the literature. Does that mean the same thing on this patient? Um, I don't know what your technology is versus other people's technology. There's all these kind of like limitations to really breaking down this data. And so what we did here at Genova was say, well, we'll break it down for you. We've got hundreds of thousands of profiles and results. Let's apply some machine learning, some artificial intelligence to be able to understand what these bacteria are doing to a greater degree. 
And that way, when you're comparing your patient results, you're not comparing it to a different technology. You're not comparing it to some other lab. You're comparing it to hundreds of thousands of people so that you can know that that result represents a huge data set and is very, very powerful that way. So with that data, we tried to break down, how do you assess the microbiome? And we came up with these three categories, abundance, pattern, and balance. And we'll briefly go into these three. So abundance is just what it sounds like, like how much bacteria is there. Um, and so really we're saying compared to a healthy cohort, which again, this is different than just looking at the general population. These are questionnaire qualified healthy individuals. So it's not just, you know, Joe Schmo on a standard American diet uh, walking down the street. This is intentional because we want to say, what is a healthy microbiome like compared to a general population? So here we can compare, does the patient have overall more commensal bacteria or overall less commensal bacteria? And basically the way to interpret this is if it's over to the right, the little slider there, that's indicating the patient has overall more commensal bacteria. What might that indicate? Uh, well, it could be something like a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, perhaps. It's hard to say because with the stool test, we're really thinking this is reflective of large intestine, but certainly could be giving some evidence into small intestine. Um, and it might be indicative of something like a recent supplementation with probiotics, right? If somebody's taking a probiotic, you would hope that is boosting up the levels of the commensal bacteria. And that might be another reason why you could see that. On the flip, the shift to the left might indicate that the patient has overall less commensal bacteria. And so this might be something that would be worrying from a microbiome deficiency standpoint. Were they on a low fiber diet? Were they taking antibiotics recently or something that could be killing their antibiotics? I remember um, even things like um, uh, exposure environmentally to antibiotics, I've seen that show up as having lower levels of commensal bacteria on some of these patients. So things to investigate from an abundance standpoint. <clears throat> The next section is patterns, dysbiosis patterns. And so what we're talking about with patterns was how can we understand the relationship between the different bacteria that are there? Because we know that it's really not about one specific bacteria versus another. It's about how all of these bacteria are interrelated, right? It's an ecosystem, it's the microbiome. So what we did was we tried to find out a couple different patterns. First one being inflammation. Is there a way that the microbiome pattern can predict inflammation? And then the second one was, does a microbiome pattern predict methane? And we'll show you how we got there. It's pretty interesting. The first thing we did was we looked at the inflammatory biomarkers that we had on the test, calprotectin, eosinophil protein X, and secretory IgA. These are markers of inflammation in the GI tract. And we asked the question, does there a, is there a pattern of bacteria that can predict inflammation based on those biomarkers? And the answer to that was absolutely yes. And in fact, we actually published a, an article where we worked with two different uh, studies, the first one using our own database and the second one working with UCLA Medical Center. And we were able to demonstrate that this algorithm derived score that we had, what we call the IAD score, correlated not only to the inflammatory biomarkers, but also could distinguish inflammatory disease patterns. So for instance, you see here on the right, uh, it could distinguish inflammatory bowel disease from IBS and celiac. So that's super powerful, in fact. And then the second study, we showed that it could distinguish significantly between healthy celiac IBS and Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, the inflammatory bowel condition. So that's kind of fascinating, right? Because we weren't integrating or evaluating the inflammatory biomarkers, we were just looking at the microbiome and we could predict inflammatory bowel disease, which is pretty fascinating. Found some other things with this study. Uh, so not surprising, the butyrate, the butyric acid, one of the short chain fatty acids was lower, acetate was higher. And if you know things about the short chain fatty acids, which are part of the test, that wouldn't surprise you so much. Um, and we found some of these interesting correlations between different bacteria, some of which we consider to be uh, maybe more opportunistic or inflammatory in nature, which is what we expected. So the key takeaway from this pattern is that it can distinguish inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, but what if they don't have a diagnosis? Well, I certainly would say, let's take a look at the inflammatory markers later on the test. Um, and if those aren't high, 
then I would really strongly be suggesting some type of microbiome management, some type of modulation to improve the microbiome so we're not setting up a microbiome pattern that could create inflammation down the road. And um, that, that's an, another fascinating area. Like, is it even an early indicator? Because we think that some of these microbiome changes might be before the actual manifestation of disease, which is fascinating. The second pattern that we talked about is the methane dysbiosis score. And here, what we did was we asked the same question, is there a microbiome pattern that can distinguish methane production? And how did we get there? Well, we also do SIBO testing here at Genova Diagnostics. And on the SIBO test, we have an evaluation for the methane score. And so we picked out thousands of samples of SIBO tests that had been a performed at the same time as the GI test. And so we looked at those patterns of bacteria and were able to correlate groups or patterns of bacteria that produced high levels of methane. Methane, why is this important? right? It's another thing to learn about the GI tract, but methane production is becoming more and more of a, an area of interest for, uh, for people who study the GI tract and overall health. And so, for example, Methanobrevibacter smithii, which is a, not even a bacteria, it's an archaea, but this is strongly associated with methane production and is kind of the culprit behind what was previously referred to as methane-dominant SIBO, which might be getting renamed to intestinal methane overgrowth or IMO. Um, but regardless, we're understanding that this methane production might have clinical consequences. One of them, and the most common one, is that methane does slow transit time. So people with high levels of methane tend to have uh, a higher likelihood of constipation. Not always the case, but that's a general trend that's observed. Um, the other thing that we're learning about methane based on our own data analysis was that the higher the methane that was being produced, actually we saw lower levels of immune biomarkers such as eosinophil protein X and secretory IgA, which got us asking the question like, well, what is going on there? What's that about? Because um, it was almost like the higher the methane production, the lower the immune response. It was kind of fascinating. And along with that, we also found higher rates of infection with things like blastocystis and entamoeba, two, two parasites. And so we were seeing high methane production triggering a low immune response and then almost a colonization effect with some of these pathogens and parasites, um, which is something brand new that we are currently working on uh, getting into the peer-reviewed literature. And we have a bit of a hypothesis around that. We know that methane production has been associated with decreased postprandial serotonin production. And we also know that in the GI tract, serotonin is a main mediator for intestinal immunity. So we can start to put together the, uh, the dominoes here where methane production leads to lower serotonin production, which also contributes to constipation, but also affects GI immune health. Um, all very fascinating, all stuff that we are learning through our own data analysis, and we have a biomarker for you to be able to apply it in practice, which is just fascinating, and it just kind of demonstrates what we're doing here at Genova is we've been studying the microbiome for, what, 30 years, and we are continuing to push the envelope in the scientific understanding of the microbiome further than anyone else in the industry. Not only that, do we have the inflammation score and the immune suppression score, uh, when you layer that as a two by two, now you start to have different patient populations where somebody who's in zone one might be considered more healthy from their microbiome standpoint as compared to say a zone three or zone four where they might have higher inflammation. So you get different information about your patient based on the zone that they fall in and what kind of intervention you might use. If you want more information on this level of detail, we have that in some of our support material too. Not going to spend a ton of time on that part of it because we've got to get on to commensal balance, which is also quite fascinating. So here, it's not about the pattern of the microbiome. It's looking at the overall picture. All 24 bacteria had a couple of different algorithms developed to say, can we compare healthy individuals overall to different types of disease cohorts. And I'll show you exactly what I mean, but this is what the graphic looks like. Um, and then we also have another way to look at this concept of balance. But what we did was we looked at this thing called the healthy pattern continuum and the reference variance score. The reference variance score was simply, we have 24 bacteria, how many of those 24 are abnormal? 
high or low, right? And so the higher the abnormality of the microbiome, the higher the reference variance score, and you can see on the right here, that was able to distinguish people who are healthy versus people who had IBS. On the flip, on the left side, we had this healthy pattern continuum, which was another algorithm that de we derived based on what we knew about the commensal bacteria, these 24 bugs, and their relationship to health. And so based on that, we created this algorithm that could, again, distinguish healthy people from people with just IBS. So then we took that information and plotted it based on different disease groups. So as you can see here, we compared healthy individuals versus irritable bowel syndrome. We got a little bit of a scatter plot there. But the crazy thing was when you compare it also not just with IBS, but maybe let's say chronic fatigue, oh, you start to see a similar pattern show up. What about autoimmune patients? We started to see a similar pattern. This showed up not only for these conditions, but diabetes, mood disorder. I mean, you name a chronic condition and it pretty much showed up with the same pattern. So what we're really showing you here is that this graph can really distinguish chronic clinical conditions from healthy cohort. And that's really kind of the idea of balance, right? We want the microbiome to be in balance. And when it's not, it starts to be similar to these different chronic clinical conditions. And the last graphic with respect to the microbiome is called this relative commensal abundance. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but basically we're just looking for other more subtle shifts in the microbiome. There's the patient results. We've got a little bit of commentary on these different phyla. And one thing to be aware of, this is starting to become a little bit more trendy to look at phyla, but I always hesitate a little bit because you know these bacteria phyla are very broad categories. Um, and even within each phyla, there's organisms that are considered uh, uh, you know, more beneficial as compared to more opportunistic. Um, so for example, in the proteobacteria, there's bacteria that create LPS and then ones that are associated with lower LPS. So there's kind of this mixed bag. And that's because these phyla are so big, it's hard to draw a direct clinical correlation. So if you're trying to make a clinical claim based on a bacteria phyla, we might be jumping a little bit in the cart ahead of the horse a little bit on that. Um, and I think it's always better to maybe look at some of the individual bacteria that are contributing, as well as what we talked about already, balance, the pattern, and the abundance, the way that we assess the microbiome on this page. Uh, certainly, anytime you find gut abnormalities in the microbiome, there's lots of things that we can do. We have support materials to kind of demonstrate with each one of the bacteria uh, how they can be modulated with a variety of factors, diet, probiotics, physical activity, sleep. So um, we have support materials for you if you're getting new into understanding the microbiome and how to modulate these bacteria. So that's there for you. Um, so again, understanding the microbiome, we're looking at abundance, pattern, balance. I think those are the three key takeaways. And let's take one more step back. The first three pages of the GI effects are all about synthesis, right? So we looked at the results overview, functional scores, therapeutic support, microbiome abundance, pattern, and balance. And sounds like a pretty full test already. So the question then becomes, well, gee, what else could be on? Well, the rest of the test is the actual data. What we've been talking about so far is just understanding the data and how to apply it clinically. So what we actually did, what we actually measured in the lab, here's what we're getting into. We start with this page that we, at least internally, and if you're in the know, you might call this the chemistry pages or the chemistry page. So these are all biomarkers. And you can see on this biomarker page, we're categorizing the different biomarkers in three sections. We have digestion and absorption, which corresponds to these different pillars. We have inflammation and immunology, and then the gastrointestinal microbiome. <clears throat> so I'll just kind of quickly go through these. There's a ton to learn about these biomarkers. Um, some of them might be familiar, but under digestion, we've got these really important markers, things like pancreatic elastase, which tells me how well somebody's secreting digestive enzymes, products of protein breakdown, and fecal fat, which are really about how well the patient's digesting and absorbing not only fat, which is found on some competitors' tests, but also protein products, which is a great indicator because if you have high levels of protein products, it can give you information not only about you know, pancreatic uh, proteases, but also things like hypochlorhydria. Is the patient making stomach acid? Or is there a microbiome imbalance where you're 
fermenting these protein products into putrefactive products, which are generally not that great for your GI health. So lots of inflammation, to, lots of information, hopefully not inflammation to be gleaned there. Uh, the next section, inflammation here, calprotectin, a quick word about calprotectin. So probably one of the most important biomarkers on the test. Calprotectin was a marker that Genova uh, helped bring to the GI uh, awareness, to the GI market, as far as understanding that this can help predict inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and colitis, and actually tends to correlate with uh, disease severity as well. Um, and so this is a marker we strongly lean on because we find that elevated. Well, now we're starting to talk in the vein of referral for GI workup, where right? we're trying to rule out Cal, uh, celiac, not celiac disease, but um, uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So keep in mind, never ignore a high level of the calprotectin. The next one, eosinophil protein X is a marker for IgE mediated inflammation with IgEs. We tend to think of uh, allergies. Um, could give you a little bit of insight around maybe potential uh, parasitic infection. Actually, we think mostly about worms in that circumstance. And then fecal secretory IgA, which tends to be a little bit more of a canary in the coal night sort of marker for uh, inflammation and immune response. A lot of things can trigger a high level of IgA in the GI tract. So if you see that being elevated, you need to evaluate further to say, what is causing the immune system to respond in this circumstance? Could be food sensitivities, uh, could be a whole host of different things, pathogenic infection, potential pathogens, dysbiosis, I mean, anything that's stirring up the immune system can cause that level of IgA to go up. So the next section of these biomarkers, we have short chain fatty acids, which the literature is just exploding about short chain fatty acids and how important these are, right? So not only are we talking about N-butyrate, which is one of many short chain fatty acids, but N-butyrate is certainly associated with all levels of GI health um, to the point where we even use it as a supplement to make sure that we're getting adequate amounts of it. It's a fuel source for the cells of the GI tract, right? They don't even, they use N-butyrate preferentially over glucose. So that's how important N-butyrate is. We also have acetate listed here, propionate, um, a little bit more subtle detail around short chain fatty acids if you're interested in that. But uh, overall, I, I think for general production of short chain fatty acids is more beneficial. And we certainly wanna see a normal or a, I would say a healthier level distribution based on these percentages here. And then the last marker on the page is one of my favorites, actually beta glucuronidase, which is, uh, it's actually an enzyme that is induced, produced by different bacteria in the GI tract. And uh, we don't wanna see high levels of it because it actually allows recirculation of fat soluble hormones and toxins, which is certainly not something we wanna be doing a lot of. So that's one of those markers we kinda of wanna keep in check. And if you're familiar with calcium deglucurate, you can see it on the pillar there at the bottom, um, that actually helps to reduce the degree to which beta-glucuronidase recirculates fat-soluble hormones and toxins. So it sort of acts against high levels of beta-glucuronidase. So um, really great information, especially if you're worried about any sort of estrogen dominance condition um, or any sort of history around hormone-mediated cancer, colon cancer, definitely a marker to pay attention to. And so that was the biomarker page. Uh, I hope that wasn't like too much, your head's not exploded, but now we're getting to the commensal bacteria and different aspects of the microbiome. Remember, this is the 24 bacteria that we used to generate the information on pages two and three, which is the kind of the, the interpretation of the microbiome. So here now we're listing out commensal bacteria by name, and this is a PCR analysis, which means it's a DNA test for these different uh, commensal bacteria. It's a qualitative test, um, and if you've heard other people speak on microbiome assessment, PCR is certainly uh, one technology that is used fairly rigorously, fairly often to evaluate. Here we're using uh, PCR to evaluate the commensal microbiome. We've got a lot of different bacteria that we can talk about on this page, so we're not going to talk about each and every single one of them. I'll highlight a couple. Clostridia is a big one, right? Clostridia genus has over 100 different species. Gets kind of a bad rap because of C. diff, um, but Clostridia is you know, it's not meant to diagnose Clostridium infections such as D. diff, C. diff, at least not here on this test. This is more commensal and genus oriented clostridium. And there's actually really great clostridiums out there. Think, they do things like produce short chain fatty acids um, and 
There's other ones that produce beta-glucuronidase and secondary bile acids. So again, not only is it important to understand that within a phyla, there's lots of different good guys and bad guys, same can go within an individual genus like Clostridium. Um, it's also necessary for immune homeostasis. So um, one to keep an eye on for sure. Another darling in the microbiome world is Ackermansia. And we certainly have seen an explosion of research on Ackermansia. Low levels are associated with obesity, diabetes, inflammation, insulin resistance. You can read all of those. Uh, a lot of different chronic conditions are associated with low levels of Ackermansia. And part of it is because Ackermansia is involved in sort of curating, maintaining the mucus layer of the GI tract. And, you know, we talk a lot about inflammation in the GI tract. And we can look at it from the standpoint of whether there's fecal secretory IgA showing up, which is kind of a first line of defense. Don't hear as much in the community around evaluating the for mucosal integrity. And so when I start to see inflammation, I'm already assuming that the mucus layer is quite likely having some problems already. If I see high levels of fecal secretory IgA, um, that could be a secondary response to low levels of um, the mucosa and acromantia is a great place to look to see whether at least that is on board to help curate and, and uh, allow for the production of mucus. We think of interventions for acromantia like uh, increased pomegranates, um, and some people will talk about fibers such as inulin as a prebiotic to improve acromantia levels. Um, and certainly we, we see it lower also with a flow FODMAP diet, which makes sense, right? If you're not familiar, a FODMAP diet is used in SIBO conditions to try to lower you know, overall levels of bacteria in response to a SIBO, a small intestinal overgrowth. So if you're trying to lower an overgrowth, you're trying to essentially starve out the bacteria. When you do that, you have a consequence. You could be starving out some of the good guys like Ackermanji here. So that's something to be aware of as well. So following the DNA analysis and getting all that information around the 24 commensal bacteria, we follow that up with a microbiome culture, a, a bacteriology and a mycology. And this is interesting, especially interesting to see kind of the different conversation that occurs around culture and um, some of the, the rap that it gets as far as being somewhat of a, you know, older technology I hear sometimes or, you know, various other things that it's not very sensitive, which not a not a ton of great research on that claim, but the microbiome culture has some really great uh, opportunities too, because it's not limited, right? There's, whenever you're doing a DNA analysis, you have to have a specific probe to understand what you're trying to find. Not so with a culture. The culture, anything that grows out on a culture plate, we're gonna find. And so from that standpoint, it's somewhat limitless. And we use an identifying technology, um, that allows for the identification of thousands and thousands of different bacteria or yeasts uh, from the culture. So we find things on the culture analysis that you're basically never gonna find anywhere else. And that's one of the great things. The other great thing about a culture is that it allows you to isolate a live organism, not something that you can achieve through PCR technology. And that also has its benefits as well. So for example, here's one great benefit of it. In this patient, we find a Klebsiella and we find a Candida. And so what we do is say, well, doc, we know that at this level of growth, Candida, Klebsiella might be something of interest for you to treat. Up to you, of course. But should you decide to treat it, we automatically went ahead and ran a bacterial sensitivity to say, of these pharmaceutical agents, ampicillin and, and the rest, or the natural agents, depending on what you want to use, these were effective against that exact bug that was isolated from your patient. Very different than other technologies that are out there. You're using any sort of DNA technology. You're kind of making a lot of assumptions to say that that agent could be useful. In this case, we have the bug that was grown. We have the agent. We tested it. It had a certain degree of effectiveness or not. And that allows you to select the things that are most effective, which is fascinating and, and wonderful from a clinical perspective, right? It's direct intervention. And I have to say, there's a lot of things out there that you might hear about culture um, that are, are kind of like not exactly um, accurate. <laughs> yeah, so culture does not pick up yeast is one thing that we hear all the time. And yeast 
are very interesting organisms in the standpoint of they're designed to withstand a lot, right? And so uh, yeast kind of develop these hard exteriors. They tolerate a wide range of temperatures. Sometimes we'll hear things like, oh, well, you know, the, the yeast will die in transit because it's coming from Arizona. And it's like the, the yeast are fair. If anything, we're trying to slow the development of yeast within a, a particular medium. So culture, if there is a yeast concern in your patient uh, about, you know, a yeast overgrowth, as it was one time called some sort of gastrointestinal candidiasis, then the culture part of it will certainly pick it up. Yeast are not as finicky as bacteria. We do have bacteria that have, you know, a little bit more, we're a little bit more challenged. So for example, lactobacillus, a very common probiotic, some of those, it's called a facultative anaerobe, meaning some lactobacillus really like to grow out under oxygen and others are more anaerobic in nature. So Kind of depends on what species of lactobacillus the patient inhabits in their GI tract, whether that will grow out in culture or not. Not so with yeast, right? So one reason why we continue to suggest that a culture analysis for yeast is, is really fantastic. Another thing about yeast to understand is that yeast is part of the mycobiome. Uh, it's a normal inhabitant of our GI tract to a certain extent. Um, and it's getting more and more recognition in the research around its associations with different health and different diseases. And yeast, because it's so ubiquitous and present in so many of our patients, we actually see it all the time. So if you were to do something like a DNA test, you should expect to find yeast in almost everyone because it's so prevalent. Um, we found internally that when we do a KOH prep, we find yeast on a huge percentage of our samples, but we don't see it in the culture. And that's likely because it was transient, it was coming through, and it wasn't any sort of thing that was causing a, a clinical presentation. And so that's the hard part of understanding where yeast fits in in your overall evaluation, such as what level is treatable? What is actually considered normal? We haven't established this yet. What are third variables that connect the microbiome diversity and the clinical presentation? These are all things that if you're looking at a DNA test for yeast and then treating based on that, we're really taking a lot of guesses because we don't know whether that's a natural normal inhabitant and what concentration we would consider to be normal. Lastly, I get to peristology, which is another uh, focus of a lot of different conversation out there. There's different things we can use from a method perspective. There's looking at the microscope, which is called an ONP, enzyme immunoassay, PCR, and even within PCR, we've got different types of PCR like 16S and NextGen and all these different technologies, um, which all need to be applied appropriately where they are, um, where they have the biggest, biggest clinical impact. So the nice thing about microscopic ONP is like culture, you're not limited. You can, anything that shows up under the microscope, we have the capacity to identify it. Not the case necessarily with PCR. You have to select which ones you are going to test for. Then again, PCR has a little bit of a greater knowledge around highest degrees of sensitivity. Um, and variability is a little bit of a concern around that standpoint too. So what we do at Genova is say, let's use all of them, right? Let's get cover all of our bases. The microscope allows us to see everything, and then we'll zero in on the parasites that are most likely to be infectious in our patient population and use PCR in that circumstance. So here's what it looks like. Left side is the microscope. Right side is the PCR parasitology. Um, this is done by, as you can see there, DNA by next-gen sequencing. And so that's something to be aware of if you're a technology nerd about some of the, the methodologies. Uh, I know that's a conversation that's happening a lot right now. So we're using pretty much all of the technologies. Um, and again, this is our approach. The GIFX is the first stool test to combine microscopic ONP with PCR technology. Um, and it's given us some really interesting data. This is kind of my last little data point, but this is fantastic here. We wanted to say, let's compare the microscope versus PCR because everyone out there is saying PCR is the best, microscope is old technology and it's missing all these parasites. Let's compare how well they're doing against each other. So we did a study comparison on blastocystis and we found that basically we had 95% agreement, which already we're like, see, 95% <laughs> agreement, like both technologies work really well. But in that 5% where they didn't agree, what was the demarcation there? And we found that 
But within that 5%, the ONP missed the presence of blasto in a, a, accounting for about 14% of those patients, whereas the PCR accounted for it in 26.8%. And what that means is, you can kind of ignore the math there, if you're trying to wrap your mind around it, but it's saying that PCR missed the blasto more often than microscopic ONP. We caught it under the microscope more often. And that goes into this whole other technology kind of can of worms, what we learned about called inhibition, which showed us that PCR is not invaluable. Um, PCR is the subject to a limitation called inhibition where actually there are other things in the samples that can stop the PCR reaction from working. And we're, we see this all across the board. This is actually quite well studied and showing that I think it was around 15% of samples have the potential to suffer from inhibition where you would find negatives as a test result simply because the inhibition process it's part of the technology wasn't working. Um, there's lots of factors that go into it. We wrote a little bit about that in our support materials if you want to know more, but we're working forward with that understanding of un inhibition as being a big potential limiter for PCR in a way that the microscope is not. So another fascinating thing, especially as it relates to PCR technology for other aspects too. Lastly, we have some additional results. Fecal cold blood is standard on every test. We can do a macroscopic exam for parasites. We also have a marker zonulin family peptide, uh, which is, as it sounds, related to the zonulin family. And then we have a whole series of add-on tests, uh, C. diff, H. pylori, Shigatoxin E. coli. All these things are available as add-ons. Um, and so with that being said, a lot of information to be gleaned here on the, the GI effects. We're talking about the most extensive set of biomarkers. We're talking about probably you know, the most advanced way of data interpretation and synthesis when it relates to the microbiome and the overall concepts of GI health and what's important there. And then lastly, whether it's bacteria, whether it's yeast, whether it's parasites, really being good stewards to the industry and utilizing the best method as it relates to each section of what you're trying to identify, right? Making sure that we're ruling out any potential false positives, reducing false negatives, and that the results that you're getting on this test are not only clinically actionable, but actually the most accurate and, and in the highest degree of integrity with our results. And we take that part of it as seriously as any other part. Um, and then we have a whole host of support materials, right? Because we know that this is maybe new information to a lot of you, or even if it's not new information, there's always things to be learning. So we have a huge support guide at our disposal, at your disposal on our website, um, fully referenced. And so that's an approach to our support materials that uh, we, we take very, very seriously as well to make sure that any clinical claim is fully referenced. And that includes everything related to commensal bacteria, pathogenic bacteria and yeast parasites. Um, and furthermore, even on our website, we have additional support materials like webinars. Um, and finally, we do have shameless plug here for our podcast called The Lab Report. Uh, that is a wonderful depiction from our marketing team here on the right-hand side of me and my co-host, Patty Devers. And so tune into that if you're interested in podcasts and functional medicine, integrative medicine. So hopefully that's a good time. Also, if you have additional questions, we always offer complimentary one-on-one -on -one, uh, medical education conversations, consults with our specialists. Uh, we have a whole team here of wonderful, wonderful practitioners who are just crazy <laughs> knowledgeable. Uh, it's quite amazing. So um, you can always give us a ring and we have 30 minute consults, 15 minute consults, whether that's, you know, I have one patient, I have their test results, I don't know how to interpret this, I'm new to this, or I haven't run a test yet, but here's the clinical picture. Please help me figure out where to even start with this. Any of those questions are fair game and we're happy to have those conversations. So feel free to give us a call. You've got the number right there. You can also do online scheduling through our website. Um, and so, yeah, without further ado, hopefully that was uh, quite a bit fascinating and look forward to hearing any sort of feedback or questions that you guys might have. So yeah, thanks for your, your time. Dr. Chapman, thank you so much. That was super informative. 
As you mentioned, there's always something new to learn regarding the GI evaluation and testing. And so you did a really great job of helping everyone understand this test today. You went over some great points from how to analyze those DIG biomarkers and functional imbalance scores to the actually different types of analysis that this test uses like PCR, culture, and microscope. So all super helpful. Thank you again. And, and at this point, I'd like to just jump right into the question and answer. And so let's just jump into the first one. And that is, how long do you normally wait before doing a follow-up test? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we get this one a ton. And obviously, you know, with any of these things, ultimately it ends up you know, person to person, I feel like one of the axioms of, of our type of medicine is always like, it depends, right? We say that all the time, but in, you know, and as a general rule, I think if you've instigated a treatment and there's, there's no real panic concerns. And by that, I mean like high levels of inflammation that might make you worry or need for a GI referral to a uh, gastroenterologist to you know, work up something significant or serious. Um, we're talking about a three to six month window, you know, where you've instigated a treatment, you want to follow up and see how well that treatment's doing. You want to make sure those functional imbalance scores are improving. Um, but that being said, if you have something more serious on board, like a, a true pathogen uh, or a significant amount of inflammation, then whether that's a referral or just something that you're doing yourself, then I tend to shorten that window a little bit, maybe to like four to six weeks. So um, that's kind of a general rule of thumb, but again, it depends on really the patient and, and your, your comfort level there. Makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you for answering that. All right, moving on to question number two, can patients keep taking their supplements or probiotics to do the test or do they need to discontinue their supplements? And this is a really common question. Super common. So, um, and, and the answer to it has seemed to evolve over time as well. So again, it's up to the treating physician, right? So anytime you have to understand what medications and supplements that your patient is on, and we never say discontinue anything that's medically necessary for the purposes of testing. Um, so with all that sort of disclaimer being said, um, it kind of depends on what you're wanting to look for, right? As long as you understand the effect of what the supplement is and you take that into consideration when you're reading the results, theoretically, you can have them discontinue or you can leave them on something. So I, I tend to think of two different patients, right? We got the patient who comes in with the shopping bag, who's got literally, they're taking everything under the sun, they're new to you, they've got a, a medical chart that's you know six inches thick. And you just kind of want a baseline. Say so we're like, we need to we need to just take you off things and figure out where you're at. Um, then that's totally viable. Like we can have them stop and we can see what their baseline is. If you're managing them and you want to say, hey, is this digestive enzyme allowing for greater digestion and absorption of fat? Or is this probiotic really stimulating the growth of commensal bacteria? You can have them stay on that and just retain that awareness that when you get the results, that's supplementing. Right. And you can do this little dance in your head of supplemented versus unsupplemented. Now, certainly there are things that are interference that we have listed on our website, which means this actually interfered with our ability to even do the test. But aside from those rare things, the rest of it, I think, is a little bit negotiable. Um, and so, again, on our website, we have a, a section called the test prep page where we go through both the interference, the things that like actually you have to stop, and then the things that might affect the results, how it might affect the results, but aren't necessarily mission critical to stop, if that makes sense. Makes sense and super helpful because lots of people take different supplements and probiotics all the time. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, the third question is, is from a practitioner again, and this is really another great question here. And when would, or when might you do a SIBO test, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth test before doing a stool test like the GI effects? Right, yes. And this is one of those tests too. It's always a where do you start type of a question. And so, um, and that even goes to things like, do I start with GI or do I start with nutrition? And it's like, well, 
I mean, they're both great sort of wide nets to cast, right? Um, but as it relates to the GI tract, I think of the GI, the stool profile as being the widest net to cast. And so if you're kind of, you've got a patient coming in and they've got GI presentation or even not, but you suggest GI involvement and you're not quite sure where to start, the GI stool test, the GI facts is certainly the place to go there. Um, and in fact, in almost all circumstances, I think is probably the best place to start, unless you're just like, this is slam dunk SIBO, like they've got nine out of the 10 symptoms as far as the SIBO questionnaire I just gave them. Um, and, you know, I just, I really want to make sure and narrow the focus there and rule that out. Um, keep in mind that on the GIFX stool test, we've got that evaluation for overall commensal abundance that I showed. We've got that evaluation for methane production. So you're going to get a ton of information already as it relates to SIBO. And other things on there that you might not be thinking SIBO are high levels of short chain fatty acids, high levels of products of protein breakdown, even low pancreatic function. These are all kind of suggestive of SIBO. So if you start going through the list and checking off all the boxes of like, oh, wow, now we're starting to really think SIBO. Uh, that's great because you, you've got all that information from a stool test and now you've narrowed rather than said, oh, I started with SIBO, didn't really got, get what I was thinking out of that. Now I have to go and do the stool test. And so, you know, I think it helps to start wide in most circumstances and then zone in from there. Absolutely. It makes perfect sense to, to take that approach. Thank you for that, Dr. Chapman. All right, let's go on to question number four here. Does Genova diagnostic, uh, Diagnostics test for antibiotic-resistant genes on the GIFX? Right. Uh, we don't do antibiotic resistance genes. Um, and one of the things that we do instead of that, like I showed on the, the previous slides, one of the previous slides around the culture, is that we're actually doing botanical sensitivity testing and, and pharmaceutical sensitivity testing against the exact organism that was isolated in the culture. Um, so I think this is, this is, in my opinion, far superior because when you're doing antibiotic resistance gene testing, what you're doing is you're sort of evaluating whether there is the presence of a gene or an RNA being produced in the GI tract, in the microbiome. You don't know who's producing it. You're just saying like, is this resistance gene around? And so maybe that was being produced by the bug of interest that you're trying to treat. Maybe it was produced by something totally different that just happened to be carrying that gene. It's, it's pretty nonspecific as compared to when we're doing the culture with the, uh, the, the sensitivity testing, we're actually isolating that distinct organism and then testing the agent against it. And it's such, you know, it's a more one-to-one -one comparison as far as what you know, what you're going after. Now you know what agent to use. So I think that's a better approach overall. Very interesting. Thank you for that answer. And then we have time for just one more question here, Dr. Chapman, and that is, what is the difference between zonulin and a zonulin family peptide? Right. So this is an interesting thing here, too. Um, so we know that science is always changing, right? It's one of those things where you think you know one thing and then you wake up the next day and it's totally different. And that's one of the beauties about science is that the nature of it suggests that we have to continually test our hypotheses and test what we know. So zonulin being a, a protein that's you know, well known by Alessio Fasano and his work and its associations with not only the intake of dietary gluten, but also how it contributes to intestinal permeability or what's colloquially known as leaky gut, right? This is the zonulin that we're thinking about. But what happened was almost all of the research in the peer-reviewed journals was done using one specific uh, manufacturer one specific kit, which we believed was zonulin. And then upon further investigation, turned out this was not actually the zonulin itself that Alessio Fasano was studying, but it was, as you know, proteins can very much resemble each other and are part of similar protein families. This was actually a, a protein that was very similar, but not identical to zonulin. So it was part of the zonulin family. So the interesting thing here is, what do you do? Okay, we know that we have to change the name of this peptide because it's slightly different, but we also know that every single piece of research that has been done basically is using this zonulin family peptide and not Alessio Fasano's zonulin. So um, at Genova, you know, we have this obligation, I think, to not only the clinicians, but to the scientific community to, to be 
you know, one of the first ones out of the gate saying, okay, this is what we've learned. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. And in the circumstance of zonulin family peptide, you can say, well, it's not exactly the zonulin we thought it was, but it's actually the same thing that all the research used. So you can keep using it in the sense of if you've studied the research around zonulin, this is the thing that was used. It just has a different name. So, you know, at Genova, like I, I said, we're, we're very, very interested in making sure that we're always being good stewards to the clinical claims that we're doing, that we're fully referencing everything that we put out there. Um, and in circumstances, funny ones like this, um, that we're also the first one to notify our clinicians because at the end of the day, I think we're all scientists. So um, that's part of it, right? Absolutely. And I love how you mentioned in science, the only constant really is change, right? So I, I believe that's very true that that's important. So thank you so much for answering all those questions today, Dr. Chapman. I know we weren't able to get to everyone's question uh, that you submitted, but please reach out to us after this live class if you still need help. So again, thank you so much for attending this live class. I want to give a huge shout out to Dr. Chapman and Genova Diagnostics. This was a very interesting and helpful presentation to understand the GI effects and all the things related to it. So again, thanks so much. And we hope to see you all at the next live class. Now, before, uh, before you leave though, Adrian Martinez, who is our head of practitioner partnerships at Rupa Health is going to put on a live demo right now for all of you. Uh, so, if you'd like to learn more, please stick around. And Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, it looks like you're on. Uh, so thank you for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you, uh, Dr. Anthony. And thank you again to Dr. Chapman uh, for that amazing presentation. Super excited to be here this afternoon. Um, as Dr. Anthony mentioned a moment ago, my name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. And so I'd love for those of you sticking around to stay around for another 15 minutes or so to learn a little bit more about Rupa Health, who we are, what we do, and, and, and really why we're dedicating our lives to building out content like the, you know, like the presentation that you just saw. Um, you know, we believe that root cause medicine should be the standard of healthcare. Um, and what we've done is we've built a platform designed to alleviate a lot of the pain points associated to ordering labs. You know, when you think about most practitioners, if you've ordered labs before, you're likely ordering from multiple labs, you know, Genova being one of them, but you could also be working with anywhere from three to six or even more 10 plus labs at any given time. When you think about the traditional sense of that, you're likely going to each individual portal to place these labs, which brings about a number of different hurdles to get over. You know, of course, one is just managing all of those different um all of those different logins and passwords, receiving your results from different places. You know, how are you managing the payments associated to oftentimes these cash pay labs, right? Um, and, and beyond that, right, how are you managing the patient experience? If your patient is working with multiple labs, they're likely getting multiple different um, instructions, FAQs, if there's a uh, blood draw required, how are you coordinating that phlebotomy, right? And, and what this ends up doing is taking a big toll on the time that you and your staff, if you have staff, are able to spend with patients, right? If you're spending hours a week focusing on the admin work associated with these labs, you're likely not able to see as many patients as you would like to see. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about Rupa Health and what we've done to, to help alleviate a lot of those pain points. So at Rupa Health, we brought on 20 plus different labs onto our platform, allowing you as a practitioner to order from all your major labs, all in one place, of course, including Genova. You are able to place your orders, track and manage the results as they come in. Your patient will have one single place to come to for support. You'll have one single place to come to support for support. And as soon as you place that order on Rupa Health, we can effectively take it from there. We can invoice your patient directly and manage billing for you. We offer multiple different payment options, including cash and credit, of course, HSA, FSA, and we can even do a financing plan. We'll send over our own curated FAQs and instructions to the patient for each individual test that is ordered for them. We can assist in coordinating the phlebotomy for your patient. And of course, if there's any questions that your patient has throughout the entire process, they can reach out to us and our team, and we'll facilitate answering those questions for them. Right. So all things traditionally that you and your team would have to do now we'll take that off your shoulders and onto ours. So how does it work? What you can see here is the Rupa Health dashboard. I'm first going to show you really how simple it is to place an order on Rupa. To start an order is up here on the right hand side, top right, where it says start an order. All we need are three bits of information to complete an order for a patient. 
the patient's first name, last name, and email address. We'll collect everything else necessary to complete this order directly from the patient. It makes things more streamlined for you, as well as ensures the accuracy of the information in case some of their information changed, you know, phone numbers, address, you name it. So this is the order screen. Up at the top, you'll notice that we can create custom bundles. A custom bundle could be a set of any tests. It could be a set of any blood panels or a combo of tests and blood panels from any one of the 20 plus partner labs that we work with. Additionally, you can create a favorites test. So a favorites test being an individual test that you're commonly ordering. So it's just appearing here at the top. That way you don't have to search through your entire catalog to find tests that you're looking to order. But if you are looking for a specific test that's maybe outside of the scope of your favorites or a bundle, you have access to over 20 plus and over 2000 different labs at your fingertips directly below your favorites in your bundles list. To order labs, all you're gonna do is simply click on what tests you wanna order, right? So to order a nutri eval, uh, all you're doing is clicking on that to order a GI effects, right? So we order three Genova tests here in just a second. And again, I can order from any one of the tests from our partner labs with just a click of the button. You need one Rupa account. You don't need to set up an account with every single lab to order these tests. One Rupa account, and as long as you have ordering access to be able to order from those labs directly, you can order with Rupa, which is amazing. Once the tests are added over here on the right-hand side into your cart, if there's an add-on test available, it's as simply, simple as clicking which add-on test that you want to add on, right? So we have all our add-on tests below here, and I want to add that Zonulin on there, and there we go. That Zonulin is added straight away. As simple as that. The test will be defaulted to be drop shipped directly to your patient. So no longer are you going to have to stock any inventory in your office. We'll send the kits as well as the um, requisitions directly to your patients. So they'll be able to do everything without having to come see you um, and operate a lot more efficiently, right? Um, from there, it'll default to having us invoice the patient. You do have the option of paying for the tests yourself but I would say the heavy majority of our, of our practitioner base prefer to have us manage billing because at the end of the day, right, you don't, that's another thing off your plate. You don't have to manage billing anymore. We can take care of that for you. But if you do decide to pay for your tests, you of course have that option available here. You would just simply manage billing outside of Rupa. You can add notes from the patient. This can be anything, right? I know that we were chatting about, you know, for example, instructions to be uh, completing and, and keeping on your, um, your regimen for whichever you know drugs you might be taking throughout the time or supplements you might be taking, right? So if you want the patient to know to continue to be taping whatever regimen that they're on, you can add notes directly to the patient for here. Um, you can add notes for Rupa. So if you'd like to let us know anything, if you'd prefer your results to be sent over to you in a specific manner, you can let us know here. And of course, any ICD-10 codes. So we can actually do insurance as well. We can do insurance through Genova, um, which I'll show you in just a second. But if the patient wants to submit a super bill to insurance after the fact for reimbursement, we can handle that as well. You just simply add whichever ICD-10 codes over into the order you want. We'll send over a template. We'll walk the patient through how to um, create that super bill and then submit that to insurance. From there, it's as simple as setting, send a patient. Now, that's how you create an order on Rupa Health, how simple it is to place your orders on Rupa Health and send it through. But let's chat about pricing. How does our pricing work? Well, we've negotiated wholesale practitioner rates with all of our labs. And what that means is the same prices that you would get going directly to any of our partner labs, including Genova, will be the same prices reflected in our catalog. The way that we generate our revenue is on each order, there is a 7% processing and ordering fee, which is paid for by whoever's paying for the tests. So what I mean by that is if you're having us invoice the patient directly and have them pay for the tests, um, they'll be the one absorbing that 7% processing and ordering fee. And we break that down very transparently, as you can see here. In this case, it's $44. Right. The roof of savings here that you're seeing below is $50. Now, what that number is, is if you're referring your patients to go directly to labs, oftentimes they're going to be charged a little bit more, right? So through Rupa Health, we are always charging that lowest possible practitioner rate. So that's how our pricing works. Now, if you are working with a patient that you know wants to work through commercial insurance, as I mentioned a moment ago, we can handle that. We can facilitate that. All you'll do is you'll change this from cash pay to insurance pay. And then from there, it'll adjust the cost of those tests to that insurance price and send that test through. We will collect the insurance information from the patient and manage everything. So you don't have to manage insurance for these at all. We will take care of that for you. But that's the offering that we offer you know, with, with our testing to place your orders. We make it as streamlined as possible for you to order from 20 plus different labs. 
I'm going to show you very quickly how we track everything within this dashboard. So in your main dashboard, you'll see all the orders that you've ever placed. You can search for specific patients. You can run filters by status of your orders. We'll always update the status of your orders as soon as we get those updates. And you can click into the in-progress orders to get an indication of timeline. So for example, here's my mycotox. Here's an order with um, you know, four tests from three different labs. I'm able to see that the sample arrived at the lab on June 1st, and I'm expecting these results to come in on June 20th or on June 12th, rather, right? So you'll always be able to check in and see where your results are. And of course, once you get those results, or rather once we receive the button results, you'll be notified and we will upload them into your dashboard for you. So you're able to hop in and view all of the results from all of your labs in one place. You're able to download them. You can send them to the patient we will never send the tests to your patient or rather the results to your patient without your consent. You can schedule a clinical consult. So should you want some assistance um, interpreting the results, let's say that I want to schedule a clinical consultation with Genova, I do have the ability to do that. Now this consultation is directly with the lab, right? So I'm able to hop in here and schedule that consultation directly through Rupa Health, which is an amazing feature that we offer here. And of course you can view the requisition should that be available. Additionally, I have the opportunity to order again, right? So let's say that I want to retest the patient six months down the line. I'm not only able to order this test again, but I'm also able to schedule this order out in advance. So that way we're leveraging the technology that's at our fingertips to ensure that the patient is going to be on track with whichever regimen that we want them to be on track with, right? So with that, that's how you place an order on Rupa Health. That's how you track an order on Rupa Health. Very quickly, I'm gonna show you what the patient experience looks like because that is very, very important to us here. So here's what the timeline will look like if you're following up here at the top. <clears throat> as soon as you place that order, your patient will receive an email from us. The kits will be shipped out within 24 hours. We'll send over those FAQs and instructions, check in with the patient and continue in increasing those uh, compliance rates for you through leveraging our technology. And then of course you're notified as the results come in. So should you, be uh, having the patient invoiced and paying for the test directly. This is what those communications will look like. Hi, Joshua. Dr. Jordan has ordered these tests for you. We will introduce who we are, and then we'll highlight the different payment options that we accept. So it's not only cash or credit, but we can do HSA, we can do FSA, and then we can do a three-month interest-free payment plan with the patient. The idea here is lowering the barrier of entry to get access to these tests, which oftentimes can be very expensive. So how can we avoid those hurdles? Well, one of the ways is offering not only price transparency, but also multiple different payment options for them. From there, we'll collect the, the uh, necessary information to complete the order, uh, billing information, shipping information, demographic information, as well as highlighting the test that was ordered for them. If you're paying for the test and, and billing the patient separately outside of Rupa, the communications will still look similar, but of course we're gonna be some key differences. We're gonna introduce who we are. We're still gonna collect that demographic and shipping information, but we're not gonna collect any billing information and we're not gonna highlight the cost of that test. That's completely up to you. Beyond that, the patient experience is the exact same. We still want to ensure that we're notifying the patient of every step of the way. So we'll be notified once the tests have been shipped out, and we will send over personalized instructions and FAQs for each one of the tests ordered. Additionally, we'll send out instructions for each of the requisitions that, were, um, that are required. And if there is a blood draw required, we can do that in a couple of different ways. We can either customize the instructions based off of your recommendations. So if you are lucky enough to you know, be a phlebotomist yourself, have one on your staff or know of one in your area, we can take that information and send that to the patient to ensure that they go to the right place for that blood draw. If not, we'll send over the options based off of the lab and the network that that lab has in place. However, if the patient can't work with any of the blood draw options sent their way, they can reach out to us and our team and we will search by zip code to find them alternative options. Of course, there's nothing that we can do to magically make you know, a phlebotomist appear if they're in, a, in an area that may not be too well covered. But what that means is it's saving you and your staff time. These are generally things that you and your team would have to search for, right? So we're freeing up that time out of your day and your team's day to be able to focus on more core work. And hopefully that means seeing patients, right? You can see on the right-hand side, an example of Dutch Complete, um, instructions that we'll send over. Um, so as you can see, they are very user-friendly, but they're additionally very comprehensive as to what to even avoid dietarily before taking the test. And if the patient has any questions along the way um, regarding how to take the test, they can reach out to us and our team. Of course, if it's a medical related question, we'll go ahead and send them back your way. 
we'll send over the options, as I mentioned before, the requisition instructions, and then of course, check in and follow up with the patient. By leveraging the technology that we have here and using it to check in with the patient consistently, we found our compliance rates to be up above 85%, which is very high. Um, and so what that means for you, of course, is a better overall patient experience, it's not only reflecting better on us, right, to have those high compliance rates, but your patients actually moving forward and completing these tests is a great sign that they're um, going to come back and see you to complete um, their treatments, right? And then from there, you're notified via email. As the results come in, you're able to check into your Rupa Health dashboard and view those results, just as I showed you a moment ago. So with that, those are basically the three main components that I wanted to highlight. I'm going to show you a couple of amazing features here in a moment, but just really just, you know, from a high level, Rupa Health is a platform designed to make your life easier when it comes to lab testing. Everything in one place, the patient experience in one place, the able to be able to track and manage all your lab orders in one place now that's available for you. It's a free platform to sign up for. That 7% that I showed you initially when you're placing the order is the only time that there's an expense associated with Rupa Health. You don't have to put a credit card down. Um, there's no subscription cost or anything in that nature. And it just takes a moment. You go to rupahealth.com to sign up. To give you a high level of, of what you know, tests that we offer, what labs that we work with, this is in the catalog, over 20 different labs, over 2,000 different tests are available for you. You can run searches, you can run filters to find which tests work best for you, add your favorites, you can create your bundles, everything's available for you. Rupa University, this is where you guys are right now. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, this isn't the only piece of content that we work with though. Um, you know, Dr. Chapman's presentation was amazing, but we have more coming up. We have actually Dr. Kalish coming in and doing this talk with us next week, a week from today. And these are gonna happen on a weekly basis every Wednesday. Uh, in any class that has taken place, we always record it and upload it into this catalog as well. So you can always hop in and uh, view any previous courses that we've done here. Jumping into more of the core support, we offer both not only just patient support, we also, of course, offer practitioner support. This goes to a real human, and that's one thing that we really pride ourselves on is being a human. You're not going to get an automated response here um, with options to select from, right? Your support message goes directly to a person who will get back to you very quickly. You can customize your settings as well. Everything from having a clinic-based setting. So if you are you know, a practitioner who has uh, another practitioner in your office that you wanna work in more of a clinic setting or you have a, a physician's assistant who helps you out with placing your orders, we can always invite them. Um, we can create those custom bundles, as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, we can add that preferred full bottom information, right? So we can make sure that this account is set up to be most efficient and effective for you and your practice. So with that, y'all, those are kind of the main components that I wanted to cover today. My name is Adrian Martinez. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you'll receive an email from me uh, after this uh, meeting later this afternoon, if not tomorrow. My name is Adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N at rupahealth.com. So if you need anything or are even interested in sending up um, a demo that will be more suited to your practice, and if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Very excited to, to you know, hear from some of you very soon.